Hey folks, have you been waiting to get your hands on MetaHuman Creator? Well, wait no more. The Early Access Program is now open. Create your own high-fidelity digital humans in just minutes. Plus, download 50 ready-made characters. Visit unrealengine.com slash metahuman-creator to sign up and get started. The Unreal Engine 426.2 Hotfix is now available for download on the Epic Games Launcher and via GitHub. Visit the forums for a full list of fixes, then head to your preferred build source to take advantage of these updates. While there, you may also notice that 426 Chaos Preview 3 is also available. This build is for those of you looking to explore the Chaos Physics and Destruction system in binary form. This week, we released a free collection of ArcViz ready characters optimized for Unreal Engine from Twinmotion. The Posed Human Pack 1 by AXYZ Design is a collection of 142 3D scanned characters. Pop over to the marketplace to download them all. Are you tired of knights and nobility? Then go live your best village life in medieval dynasty, set in the harsh realities of the Middle Ages. Storm our feed to learn how Polish developer RenderCube combines simulation, RPG, and strategy mechanics to create an incredibly intricate open-world survival game. The most significant leaps in game development often arrive on the back of new tech. Discover the hardware innovations from Intel, AMD, NVIDIA, Logitech, and Alienware that are redefining the next-gen player experience. One teacher's love of real-time technology has become a fountain of inspiration for his high school students, who are now building games, exploring virtual production, and creating VR pinball machines in Unreal Engine. Learn more on the feed. Looking to step up your real-time skills? Feast your googly eyes on the new free courses available now on Unreal Online Learning. Explore the basics of materials, the steps for data prep, and the use of control rig with sequencer and physics. Head over to Unreal Online Learning to get started. Over 1,800 talented creators participated in the Unreal Engine Short Film Challenge Australia, showing off a wonderful diversity and wealth of talent in their projects. Hear from a sampling of the finalists and uncover their experiences in the emerging world of real-time filmmaking. And after nearly two years in early access, tactical deck-building adventure Trials of Fire is celebrating its long-awaited launch. We caught up with What Boy Games to learn more about the game's evolution and ongoing development. Check out the interview. And over to our top weekly karma earners, many, many thanks to Every Nun, Clockwork Ocean, Churer, Bama Game, Grumble Bunny, Static Void LOL, Nacho Monkey 2, Crew Dimer, Kahel 18, and AJE42. On to our community spotlights, Dev Enabled is a general game development YouTube channel with loads of great videos to help you create your own indie adventure. Tutorials typically focus on pipelines and game feel and a variety of 2D and 3D software. See all the videos available on Dev Enabled's YouTube channel. Get your groove on in Spell Beats, a spellcasting rhythm game. Punch harder, heal faster, and throw farther while sustaining a solid rhythm. Mastery will be the result of perfectly playing spell beats while strategically responding to enemy attacks, positioning, and elemental states. Download Spell Beats on Steam. And the final piece today is called Life Hunter, a story on global warming and humanity where scattered life is the only thing that matters. This is just a teaser of a longer form story, so stay tuned to Amaro Zayas' art station page for future updates. Thanks for watching this week's news and community spotlight. Hey everyone, and welcome to Inside Unreal, a weekly show where we learn, explore, and celebrate everything Unreal. I'm your host, Victor Broden, and my guest today is Simon Verstrate, technical artist from SideFX. Welcome to the show. Thanks, Victor. Thank you for having me. Great to be here. Yeah, and I appreciate the late notice because as of last week's stream, I didn't actually have any guests this week because I had a cancellation. So big up to Ben Mears on SideFX for pulling this off and for Simon for um, coming on last minute to talk a little bit about the procedural tools with Houdini. Um, Y'all have been working on some cool stuff recently, and that's what we're going to show today. So we can quickly jump here into a small presentation, and I will also do some uh, demos in Unreal, of course. Um, so yeah, let's go through a few, few slides. I will just talk Ooh, a bit one about moment. Sure. OK, you're good. Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead now? OK. Yes. Uh, so first of all, I want to go through some slides, uh, talking a bit in general about um, Houdini, Houdini Engine, 
so everyone gets an idea uh, about what, what I'm going to talk about and what Houdini is doing here. Um, so let's go. So I want to talk about Houdini Engine and version 2 about this. So giving an intro to that. And I'm also going to use the starter kit. And this is going to be a small live demo where I'm going to go into Unreal and play around with some procedural tools. Uh, and then I also want to mention something about Project Titan, uh, which is a learning project uh, from SideFX this year. Uh, so we'll give you a bit of sneak peek in uh, what that project will be. So first of all, let's talk about uh, Houdini Engine. So what is this Houdini Engine? Um, so we have our Houdini software. So if you would not be familiar with Houdini, it's a node-based uh, software where everything you do is a node. So if I have a box and I would do a bevel, uh, those are separate nodes. So with Houdini, we can then create procedural tools uh, like a rock or three house generators. Like we can all make cool tools inside of Houdini, uh, do procedural things and setups in Houdini, which are great. Uh, and then the next step would be like, how do I take these tools and bring them inside of Unreal? That is where something which is called Houdini Engine comes in. So we can send the tools to Unreal directly or even open them in Unreal. So our tools, like a tree generator, is now being able to open inside of Unreal. We also have this plugin for other softwares. So we have it for Unreal, Unity, uh, Max, Maya, and so on. So we have a variety of usage here. So it's a really powerful way of opening a procedural tool you built in Houdini into another software. Uh, special here to mention is that this is for uh, an editor mainly. So you mainly use this to build faster your environments, and then you just bake out the results. So this is not something uh, that we want to use in runtime. Uh, then I'm going to show you some small video demos uh, about what this is. So here I have a small demo here. So in the game in real, we have like sliders, so we can change the slider, and then we proceed to generate new variations. So it's quite artist friendly uh, because we are just working with basic menus like a slider or toggles or menus. Like we can just slide here and then generate different variations of that. So this is how it would look like it in Unreal, for example. So it's a quite simple tool, but we can already generate multiple different versions with this tool. So you can see I can quickly get versions uh, from this sci-fi thing. Uh, then here is quickly another example, which is a IV tool. So if I would move the sphere here, it will automatically recalculate where things are growing. So it's whenever I move it, it will automatically try to find a new path around these objects. And this is also non-destructive. So I can still move my original inputs, like spheres or boxes, and it will automatically uh, start updating. So as you can see here, it's just updating that. So quite non-destructive. And we can also just, for example, grab another tool like a tree. So we grab the tree tool, load it in, and a few seconds later, I have my uh, tree here. So it's all done procedurally. And already like building a few small tools can be very powerful. Uh, so in this case, if you, if you want to build like a forest with like some ivy growing on top of a building, like you would be really quickly with using a few tools. Then next up, I want to talk about uh, version 2. So now you have some idea of what Houdini Engine is. So you can uh, open our Houdini tools in Unreal, for example. But we recently have Houdini Engine version 2. So we have a few new features. Uh, I mainly want to talk about PGT, what composition, session sync. Uh, there are, of course, way more than that. But I want to just like quickly give you a glimpse of what's new. Uh, so we have PDG, which, tends, uh, which is actually for larger calculations. Uh, so basically, the node here uh, in Houdini will look like this. And every green dot is a task. So if I need a tree and I need 50 different variations of a tree, I can use the different tasks here to give me each different tree. So that's basically what PTG is so just like large calculations of a tool, like we can quickly get different results from one tool. Uh, so we can use that to make bigger worlds. And we also have a special menu for Unreal. Uh, here it's a small demo of that. So in the background now, Houdini is calculating everything. Once it's done calculating, it will bring everything into Unreal. So here it's seeing that they will. Uh, one, uh, one part of a terrain is a task, so it will bring that 
into the scene when it's done calculating. And that's how we can, for example, build something bigger, something that's more, more of an open world uh, game. Set some a quick example of what you can do with PG. You can do all kinds of things with PG, but in this case, it's like world building. Uh, then next up is uh, world composition support. So world composition is a feature from Unreal, which allows you to manage a uh, bigger world. So if you have an open world game, this is quite interesting. So you will basically get a top-down view of your map, and you can easily manage your world. And in Houdini, we can say that, hey, when we output something that's train work with road composition, so it's like automatically a bit set up for that. So we also have then auto streaming, things like that. So we can really work together with Houdini and Unreal uh, to make that happen. So here's also then a small demo of that. So I previously generated the desert. Now I'm walking around in it. And you can see here that the gray areas are being unloading and the colored areas are being currently loaded. So as I walk around, you will see that things start to load and unload. And this is all basically done by default with world composition. So it's a great way of combining the two powerful softwares together where Houdini generates the world, generates some terrain, prop placements, and so on. And then in Rio, for example, we use the world composition uh, to make this all happen. So it's just an example here. And you can see it's clearly unloading parts that are really far away from the player. You can also, of course, tweak these values as you go. But this is something that you almost get out of the box. Uh, then let's talk a bit about session sync. Uh, this is a connection between the two softwares, so Houdini and Unreal, but also Unreal and Houdini. So if I have something open in Unreal, I can also see it in uh, Houdini. So also draw the small video of that. So here in Unreal, I have these sliders again, so I can play around with the sliders. And it will update in both software. So that's a great feature and also great for debugging. So if I have an issue in Unreal, I can always open Session Sync and see what's going on in the background when I go into Houdini. So you can also just, in Houdini, play around with sliders there. And you can see that it automatically uh, will update in both softwares. So it's a great feature. And again, if you're building a tool and you need to debug something, you can just connect the softwares and it is working together. So that's quite useful. Uh, here's also another thing that I did with it is a small house generator. So in Houdini, I have a simple layout generator. So whenever I click that button, random layout, it will give me some random cubes. And this automatically gets used by a building generator and then turned into a house by Unreal. So we are basically sending point clouds. And uh, from these point clouds, we then uh, uh, use instances. So these were some features that I wanted to talk about uh, from the newer update to the plugin. So V2 has also been written, rewritten from scratch. So it like works way faster than the one before. Uh, but there is, of course, more stuff that you can check out about this new plugin. So we have a, a couple talks. So I did a talk, uh, Houdini with Unreal, but also Damien did a talk. And Damien is one of the developers on this plugin. So definitely check out the talk by Damien. And he also shares a few things uh, for the future about uh, where this plugin goes. So I sent a link to Victor. So you probably should find uh, one of these links in a somewhere description, I think. They're in the... So, uh... <clears throat> Forum announcement post underneath resources is where you can find them. Thank you. So yeah, if you're interested, you can check them out. Uh, quite interesting if you want to know more about plugin and things it can do. Uh, then we are almost going to the live demo. So I want to show you some starter kit assets that we have at SideFX. So first of all, the starter kit is a free tools. So you can use that for learning. If you just want to try out Houdini engine, uh, you can just download them for free, open them in your project, and play around with them. So of course, you will need Houdini engine. So that's important to know. Um, it's beginner friendly, and you don't necessarily need Houdini engine or a, a need Houdini experience. Um, so you can just open these tools in Unreal, and you can play around with the sliders as you saw before in the videos. So you can just play around with sliders like you don't need Houdini experience. Of course, if you want to like modify these tools. Uh, you then, of course, will need some more 
within your experience because you can open these tools and edit them uh, if you want to. So now let's jump into Unreal and I'm going to give you some demos there. So I don't know if there would be any questions already, Victor. Received a couple. Um, don't think we've had enough. Yeah, let's maybe go through them. I think most of them are fairly general. So mm -hmm. we can go ahead and cover them um, during the, the Q&A at the end of the, of the stream. Okay. Sure. Yeah, so now let's go into Unreal here. So I already have an asset here. But of course, first to mention is Houdini Engine needs to be installed. So I have it here at the top. And I'm also connected to a session. So that's also important that you are connecting. So now I have this tree, but I can also grab it here. So we have a tree. I can drag and drop it in the scene. It will sort of like calculate and warm up the tool a bit. So this might take a sec. And once it's done, it's then ready to use. I will work way faster, of course. So here we have that tree. So this is a tree. So it's the same asset that you see here, but just with some different settings. So what I can do with this tree is I can, for example, move around these points. So by default, I see this line, and I can click this point over here and start moving that. So if I move this over here, you will see it automatically uh, updates. So you can move that around. So I can go, for example, grab this one, go a bit more extreme. And now my tree leans more in that direction. So from here, we can then change some properties. Like again, we can build custom uh, menus here to what you want. So a tech artist would like build these tools and then you can have some like level designers or other artists uh, using this interface to then modify the procedural tool. Uh, so let's say I want to lift up the branch here. So let's lift it up. And you can see that they're sort of like going closer to each other. So if I increase it more, you can have that in variation. Uh, there are some more settings here to like play around with these branches and so on. Um, but let's talk a bit about the leaves since it's quite different. So here I use a low poly style, where on the other one I use more like a plain cards uh, for leaves. So I built a small uh, checkbox here. So if I would now don't use the chunky leaves and use the normal leaves, these are the cards, we now have the card here. So under uh, leaves, we can also assign a material. So I already pre-built some stuff here. So if I would drag and drop it in here, we should have that material. So now we have that as well. So I can play around with settings, so I can make this a bit bigger. That's nice to make it a bit bigger. We can play around with uh, seeding, so just like generating a, a variation. They are like scattered a bit different around the tree. Uh, and also the color of this gradient is also coming from vertex color. So in here I have this green vertex color, and then I actually used a hue shifting to make it like the red color. So that's how this is sort of working. So again, we can always go back and forth between settings. Like if you're not happy with like this left wing value, like maybe it needs to be more, we can go back and forward. I uh, also have a setting here to like push down near the part here. So it's like pushing down a bit more. So we can always go back and forth between this tool because it's a procedural tool. So even if I'm not happy with this line, I can grab one of these dots and change things here and there. So let's say you have this asset. And now I want to use this in a game. So currently, it's still like a Houdini asset. Um, but we have an option here for baking assets. So once you finish, you can just click Bake. You can bake to an actor, blueprint, some other things. Uh, but in this case, let's just click Bake to actor. So it's output to an actor. And normally, uh, if I would go here, it created a new folder called Houdini Engine Baked Folder, and I have some trees here. So here, this is the tree that I'm currently having. So it's the same result as you see. I also made some other one before. So you can just 
now quickly just spend half an hour making like 10 to 20 different trees for your game and you're done for that. So by just having a simple tool, you can already start generating different versions. And that's basically how uh, you would build this. So here, this is still a normal mesh. And here's my Houdini engine. So you still have some more settings here for outputting and like you can automatically delete this asset, this uh, Houdini asset when you have done baking, for example, and so on. So that's the, the cre a tree example. If you're interested in Houdini itself, we also offer some uh, tree tools. So we don't have to build tree generators from scratch. We have some tree tools there. So are there any questions, for example, on this tree or are we good to go? We had one question, which is, where do you get the tree generator? <laughs> so it is part of the the quick uh, the starter kit. I also normally send you that link, so it should be available there as well. So or you can just Google uh, Houdini starter kit. You should be able to uh, quickly see that. Pacing so in again, chat right now. <laughs> so again, this is all free. Like what I'm going to show you next will also be available for free. So if you have access to Houdini Houdini engine, you can just try it out. Uh, or if, if your studio is interested in Houdini, you can just try these out for free. Uh, then here we have the uh, road tool that I made. And this road tool is built out of boxes. So I often find boxes or simple shapes like quite useful to guide a tool. So if I now uh, click this box, so I already did some setup here. So if I would rotate this, the tool will start and it will update. So you can see we now have this road. So I can make something more complex, uh, like maybe this. You can see that that perfectly works. So now I can press play and I can walk around. So I can walk around to the street. And now I can just like say like, hey, maybe this road needs to be bigger or I need more space here and there. I can just jump back to our tool and we can move things around. So maybe I want to move this back here and it made some changes. So let's look a bit at the parameters. So the way I use the boxes is by something which is called a world outliner input. So we can basically select here things. So these cubes are all selected. So if I would deselect this cube and use a selection, it will now remove this cube. So that cube is not in that system anymore. So if I now Go back to selection, select this back, and this is now back in the system. So the idea is here that you can just grab the cubes here from Unreal, uh, add more of them, and make a more complex road. Hey, Simon. So yeah. Sorry sure. for interrupting. We're, we're seeing a little bit of artifacting coming from your screen share here. Um, let's go ahead and just go be right back for a moment, and we're going to go ahead and adjust some of Simon's settings to try to compensate for the uh, upload rate of his internet. Uh, we will be right back, everyone.
All right, we are back. Thanks for waiting, everyone. Uh, just adjusting some settings on Simon's end to make sure that we don't have all those nasty artifacts when he's moving around in the interface. Cool. I think we are good to continue, Simon. Please go ahead. Okay, thank you. Um, so yeah, so we had our rotor, and based on these boxes, we can generate uh, some shapes. Like it automatically figures out intersections and so on. Um, now let's quickly show some settings so we can adjust the size from this square. So now it's just like fifty by fifty. You can make it bigger. Uh, we have some like settings for the border, like this border you see here. Uh, we can add more geometry to this or less. So if I would say the corners here are five, you would see that they are like more low poly. If I would Increase this back to 10, they are more smoother. Uh, furthermore, some settings for the root lines or also like output settings so we can automatically also generate collisions from Houdini and bring them in Unreal. That's also possible. Uh, we have some UV properties uh, and also materials. So we can have uh, multiple IDs or we can have a single ID with vertex paint. So as you can see, like we can really build our own menu to whatever you need is. So in this case, you can like build multiple, multiple material ideas, some UV settings, and so on. So you can do a lot of different things and build your own menu. So again, you can always go into Houtini and add or remove more options to, for this tool. So if you already would be more experienced, you could just take this tool, you can download it from the website, and you can maybe start building a house generator on top of this. Like you can have uh, calculate that there is enough space here, and maybe let's divide that space into a couple squares and then uh, extrude them to a house. Uh, so that was a bit about the road tool. And now I want to show you another interesting tool, which is the uh, edge damager. So this is all in game engine. So we can do edge damaging here. So I grab that tool. So HDAs, um, edge damaging. So drag and drop that. So we can take some time to calculate. And here we have a basic setup. So you can see that it's chipping off the edges of an object. And we can use something like this. So these simple shapes. And again, these are shapes from in real. Like if I need an extra box here, just add that box here. Like maybe I want something at the top. Let's get it like so. And now I can uh, use my input menu again. So we need something from our world or scene. Then start selecting, select these, and use as input. And now it jumps automatically to that location. But uh, I build an option here to align output. So it's snapping back to my original pivot here. And so now we have that result now with edge damaging. So I hope you can see it on the stream, uh, this edge damage. Yeah, um, so occasionally we're receiving your your packets a little after you're showing things. Um, oh. So why don't you try to just be a little slower, and I think we can follow along. We're still seeing some artifacts. Unfortunately, all uh, we cannot fix Simon's internet uh, right now. We're doing as, as good as we can um, in the pandemic, I guess. Next time, Simon, I promise I'll fly out to the office. Yeah, sounds great. <laughs> So I will go a bit slower then, so it's good to know. Um, so yeah, so we have this tool that takes a basic input like these boxes and automatically applies some edge damaging. And this is actually done by a Boolean. So under the hood, I use a Boolean operation and it will cut off uh, edges here along an object. So if I would go here somewhere else, you can see that all these edges are cut off. Um, so we have some settings for that as well. So we have, a, of course, a basic seed parameter, which is then for variation. So if we change that, uh, we have some variation. So it's probably like quite subtle on the stream, uh, because the damage overall is quite subtle. Uh, we also have resolution. So if you look close enough, we have like quite low poly uh, cut here, so we can increase or uh, lower that so we can increase our uh, these polygons so they have like less or bigger chunks. 
Uh, then of course we have an intensity slider, so I can make this quite intense, or you can keep it super subtle, like only like edges and maybe a few cuts here and there. Uh, then we also have a noise intensity. So if I would crank this up, you would see now some more noisiness or variation. So you could see it's a bit more chipped now. So the chips are a bit more extreme with the noise increase. So if I would increase the scale of the noise, we will have some more like bigger scale in that noise. So we also have, some, for example, chips here along a round surface. So again, so a few settings here and there to play around with damage settings for quickly damaging objects. And something that I've not shown is that we can always go back and forward. So my original input is still seen as active. So if I would go back to my original input and let's use the scale, we can then always go back and forward between that. So I can quickly scale this up, scale this down, uh, make this a bit bigger, maybe it needs to be a bit smaller. Like we can always go back and forward between our inputs and our VBE tool. So now what is interesting here as well is that we can also subtract. So I can enable subtraction and we can subtract this shape. And I want to use that sphere, so select sphere. And now that sphere is seen as a subtraction for my Boolean operation. So if I now grab my sphere and collide with my blockout, you can now see that we are chipping off this whole chunk. So let me move my sphere around. So you can see I just in real time and in real did like this Boolean uh, on geometry here with the Houdini tool. So we can move that around, play around with that. It's also applying some edge damage here as you can see. Looks great. Um, 3D Geo was wondering, adding edge damage, adding, uh, sorry, <clears throat> here, I, can, <laughs> I know how to talk. Adding edge damage would add poly count. Is there a way to automatically bake out the normal map of the damage and apply it to the original mesh? Uh, in my setup, what I have here, no, but what you're asking is definitely possible. Uh, and Houdini has a maps baker, so you can bake out normal map, height map, diffuse, vertex core, you can do roughness, you know, also all kinds of things. So you would have to, you could build on top of this tool, like you could open this tool, uh, add a baker in there, and then sort of like unwrap the, the input here, like you can do some auto UVing on the, the original model and then bake in there. So that's, that's definitely possible. But in here, I'm uh, not doing that to make things a bit easier. And that's something that would be um, maybe not easy, but you would at least have the option to do that, sort of just um, adjusting one of these sort of starter tools that you've already provided in the starter kit. Um, building upon one of them, right? And sort of add more features from Houdini um, into the Houdini engine. Yeah, definitely. Like, again, these tools are editable. Like, they're not, like, locked behind something. You can open them in Houdini. Uh, you can just say, unlock asset, and you can go into this asset. You can start uh, adding out UVing and adding a baker for normal map, and you're basically done. If you know how Houdini, then... I think you can pre pretty quickly like assemble that in here. Uh, then I want to show an another example, and uh, this is actually with a mega scan, so we can also uh, use a mega scan asset. So instead of my inputs being the block out, uh, let's grab the mega scans here. So start selecting. Mega scans, uh, and now this barrier is being edge damaged. So let me bring it here. So, uh, so of course I'm overriding the material here. Like you can see, I'm, I have like this uh, vertex color, but I can 
patch damage this now, so maybe let's increase some values here. Like you could see him clearly like damaging a few areas here and there. Yeah, like this is more extreme. So I'm really like damaging these areas. And for uh, UVing, I actually have an option here to keep uh, UVs. So we can keep the UVs that you inputted. Um, but of course, then for the damaged areas, uh, I did some auto UVing there. Uh, but of course, like it's auto UVing. So if you want it to be something very specific, you can, of course, uh, do that in Houdini. Like if you have like specific area of your texture where this uh, damaged part needs to be, like you can build that. But in here, I just have an option for. Uh, uh, keep UV, we can also do auto UV and so on. So, if you also don't use any UV, of course, this will calculate faster. If you do auto UV, that it also, then you also add auto UV on top of uh, the Boolean damage here. But it's definitely possible to use something like a Mega Scans asset and uh, do some Boolean damage here, like you could see. And again, my sphere is still uh, linked here. So, let me get my sphere. And Let's get out a part of the barrier. So you could see, I'm just like cutting and damaging this barrier. So we can play around with that. This is a, a small demo of that Boolean tool. So it can be quite useful. Uh, you, can, you, can, you can open this in Houdini and tweak settings in here. Like if something is not necessarily what you want it to be, you can always uh, go into Houdini. Or you can like you can like, you can open like the session sync where you can like have two softwares having the same results. So you can like change uh, along you go. Hailfall was wondering if the column was made out of basic shapes and then remeshed into a single object. Uh, so what I basically do here is there's no, necess no, no necessary like remeshing, but just like a boolean. So I boolean this shape together. So we don't have like the, the insights here. I can probably quickly show that by any playing wireframe. Um, so again, you can choose to do like a remeshing or a voxel or other things. Uh, so in this case, if I would go inside, you can see that it's like brilliant as one single mesh. So even here, uh, it's like now one mesh. I can click on maybe go wireframe. So you can see that it is. I think I added also some extra divisions here. I'm not sure. Uh, but yeah, you can see like it automatically like deletes some inside because it's a boolean, so it will delete these overlapping parts. Yeah, I think I had. I think I I did some divisions here to support uh, the geometry better. But I also built in the poly reducer, so yeah, I built numerous of options here. But again, you can treat this as much as you want. This is just like a demo tool for you to try. So we now have this really damaged pillar. Um, so yeah. So any more questions on this while we while I have it open? have some more just definitely more questions <laughs> let's see um which one which one which one does the boolean tool work with dy uh dynamics uh and dynamics you mean not entirely sure that was the question <laughs> <laughs> i was hoping you would know what they were referring to. Um, well, it's it's mainly just pure for geometry. Like if you just like very static geometry, like it is designed to input like very basic static geometry. Like you have these boxes and this barrier. So again, like this is something that you use in editor. So if you play your game, you would bake out uh, this asset to bake out everything to a single static asset. So there's no dynamic. Uh, thing here. That makes sense. Um, Christos Marios Ftishiris was wondering, what about collisions in this case? Um, and I, I would assume it's the same thing, right? You actually, you 
generate a mesh out of that, and you then have to generate collisions for that mesh. Yeah, yeah. So in this case, I don't think I build an option for collision. So on the road to, I had like an option for collision. And here I didn't. What you could do is you could use this uh, base input uh, and assign it in, in, as collision in Houdini, because Houdini will receive the same mesh here. Uh, and then you can just say like, hey, you can give it the tag, like you need, you can assign tags to geometry and then it will see, see it as actually a collision. So that could be maybe uh, interesting to do. The other ones are fairly general, so uh, you can continue, and then uh, I'll make sure to go through them in the end. Yeah, uh, yeah. So I have one more demo here that I want to show you live, uh, and that is a small uh, level generator. So it's very useful, like for like a top-down game. Um, so here, this tool uh, generates a level on based on boxes here in this case, but it also uses something which is called wave function collapse. Uh, but first, let's just show the boxes. So if I move the box, it will then update here. So my tool is now uh, warmed up. So you can see if I move these boxes, uh, it will update. So that's something or a way to like block out quickly like a level by just placing boxes and then hooting to calculate scenario. Uh, so what is special here is that you might notice that they have like some specific colors. So a corner has this gray. The, these straight pieces are like more pinkish, then the ground is more purple, uh, like they have all a specific color. And that is because they are using a modular set. So uh, the artist or an artist or yourself has to build like this modular kit. So here I took some few pieces of a modular kit. And normally what you would do is you would like, you know, like manually uh, put this together, like so, like copy paste it. Uh, Take some time to like put everything nicely together. Uh, but with this Houdini tool, uh, it basically figures out where things are. So it will take that model and it will place it on the nice position where it needs to belong. So that's the idea of this tool. If you're interested in these sort of tile sets, it's using a Wang tile set. So if you would, uh, Google that, you will find more about uh, what this is. So it's called a Wang tile set. So it's quite interesting if you are into these procedural things. Um, now let's jump into like wave function collapse. So let me crack quickly grab an image here. So here uh, I have an image. So it's like 20 by 20 pixels, so it's super low res. And what it will do is wave function collapse will sort of like analyze the image and it will scale it up or try to repeat that on a bigger scale. So it's great for for example, to quickly generate levels. So I can roughly sketch out what I want this layout, and then wave function collapse will try to replicate uh, that on a bigger scale. So here I already filled in a texture, and I'm going to enable wave function collapse. And as you can see, it is now generating these extra rooms. So on top of my cubes, it is also now generating a random layout. So based on the wave function. Um, so here, uh, let's say I want to have a bigger level. Let's say I need it to be like 50. So it's very at the moment. So the bigger the level is, the more time it will take for the wave function collapse to calculate. So you can see it's now like a bigger level. But of course, I'm going to maybe keep it smaller here so it's a bit faster. So we can also again play around with seeding values. So um, we have here variation. And if I would now quickly grab my player, my Unreal guy, and place it here, I can now play this level. So I can walk around in this level. So again, you would have to like use your own modular assets and kit. Uh, to make this more final, but the overall idea is that we have a tool that automatically plays modular uh, tiles next to each other, so we don't have to worry about that. I've also made a tutorial series on this, which is called the Dungeon Generator, so that might also be interesting if you're looking into like sort of like level generators. Uh, so I have some more settings here. You can also delete that gray border if you don't need that. 
So we just have this level. So again, like we have this randomly generated layout, a function collapse, and we can combine it with custom uh, meshes here. So if I need to have this specific boss room over here, like I need a boss room over there, so I need more springs, I can drag the, the cubes around to have that springs there. So that's basically a wave function, uh, the generator with wave function labs. Uh, we can also scatter here these cubes, like you can replace that by assets. So what could be interesting is, let's say I want to grab my tree here, and I want to use my tree in one of these instancings. So here we have uh, instances, so we can set this to Unreal, uh, but we also have uh, different outputs as instances. So now let's place the cube with my tree. And as you can see, now I have these trees automatically assigned here. So again, these are just instancing. So if I would uh, play this now, you can see that we have automatically now scattered around these trees. Is it possible to run that generation at runtime, or is it editor time only? Yeah, so it's editor, editor only. So the Houdini engine overall is, is mainly for editor purposes. So it's for building things faster. And then when you want to play it, you just sort of like have a baked mm -hmm. version of that. So that's the overall purpose of the Houdini engine here. So yeah, so that was the generator. So again, I can also like, for example, bake out this model and plug it into another system, or maybe I could use the edge damage tool to build my modular kit, and so on. I can use different kind of small procedure tools to plug in bigger, to plug in bigger procedure tools, and so on. So that was it for the demo. So again, we have more uh, HDAs or with any tools you can have at the S two. I'm not going to go over every single one. Uh, that will be a bit longer. But yeah, feel free to check them out. Yeah, there's both a started tutorial on sidefx.com as well as the download for the Unreal Started Kit from SideFX. Uh, you can find all the links in the forum announcement post on the Unreal Engine forums. Um, ready for a couple of questions? <laughs> yeah, I also have like a small uh, last part of the of our presentation. Oh, or, yeah. please go ahead. Do you mind guess why? <laughs> uh, so last thing that I just quickly want to go over is uh, Project Titan. So that's something we also have been working on. Um, uh, let's go to Project Titan. Uh, so Project Titan is something SideFX will be working on this year. So it's mainly a learning project. So we want to show a process of building a full scene. So we will have some story, and around that, we will build a certain scene. So we will build a cinematic and a real-time site. So for the cinematic, we will have uh, Rob Straffer, who will be leading that, and that will be more uh, for the real-time site. So I will be using Unreal to make a real-time scene uh, for Project Titan. And of course, everything will be seen as a learning project. So we will share what we built. We will, we will make tutorials around things that we built. So if you have any questions like, hey, how did you guys do that? We will just then make tutorials and show you how we did certain things. So that is basically what Project Titan is or what we want to do with it. So I really want to give you a few sneak peeks. Uh, but I also want you to remember that this is still early on, like we are early on in the process of this, because this will be along the year. So you might see a few more things here and there uh, as we go. So what I've been doing is, for example, blocking out a scene. So this was an alleyway. So we had an ID as an alleyway. And I blocked out the scene. And I also wrote down in Unreal, so this is all in Unreal, uh, what happens here. So the character wakes up here, then he walks over there, and so on. So what was great with this is I basically give this to the, the cinematic guys, guys who are working on the cinematic, who will be more like um, rendered in Houdini. And they use then uh, USD. So they will uh, grab that scene, uh, convert it to the USD file, and then open it in Houdini. 
So that is sort of like a quite interesting way of working where we just quickly in Unreal can block out things. I can quickly get an idea in my head into a scene and make it already look good. And then here we then have it open in Houdini. Like again, these are like early shots or early renders, uh, but that's the overall uh, workflow that I had here uh, that I think is quite interesting. So of course, not everything works perfectly with USD. Like if you have like a very complex uh, material with like vertex paint or height lerps, like the ground here you see in this picture, if that like some vertex painting and height lerps that will not perfectly translate uh, with USD, of course. Um, then another thing is then I build a small preview of a city that we want to build. So again, we want to, of course, have some procedural nature to this. So at the moment, it's it's not fully procedural because we are still working on this, but this is sort of like already trying to get the first view of what we want to have. I also want to mention that we are using some uh, assets here, like we are using Megascans, Git Bash 2D, so we don't have to build every single asset. We can then focus on uh, generating these things and using all kinds of different like packages like Megascans to uh, build our world a bit faster. Also, here is a quick sneak peek of the generator, the, the house generator. So Paul from SideFX has been making some updates uh, to the house generator. And I can now basically use a pattern, like you could see here, I can type certain numbers, and then each number stands for a certain module. So if I want to have a store next to a hotel, next to a museum, I can just type the numbers of that, and it will then try to fit these models next to each other. So that's sort of like a quick demo here of the house generator. So again, we are still working on this. So this is something that we are exploring. So the next steps would also be bringing this into Unreal so we can just, in Unreal, uh, block out a scene, have this tool, type in some patterns for the store. So if I want to have a specific area with stores, I can just type the pattern like, hey, I want uh, five stores here next to each other. Uh, that would be possible. So that's just a quick uh, look at Titan. So again, uh, Titan, we are working on it and we will be making tutorials about how this is done so if you're interested feel free uh, to check that out so currently there's not much about it but you will probably hear more about this uh, along the go uh, and now victor uh, i will answer everyone's questions <laughs> it's time i'm so excited <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much simon all right let's dive right into it um, we have some general questions around Houdini as well as the um, Unreal plugin. Um, I think let's start from the bottom here because some of them are relevant to some of the late, later things you were showing. Um, Hailfall was wondering if the scatter tools, if it's possible possible for them to scatter blueprints as well as other assets. Yeah, uh, you can almost scatter everything. You can scatter blueprints, uh, lights, particles. Uh, yeah, you can scatter a lot of different things. Pretty much any U asset then. Uh, yeah, you can directly call the light by its name. Like you can have the point lights scattered around five point lights. You can even assign colors to it. So if you want to scan uh, scatter ten lights and they need to have uh, a different color, each of them you can assign random colors. For example. Awesome. Uh, Julian Boolean was wondering: Can blueprints access and modify HDA parameters? Uh, that's something we have some blueprint support, but it's still like uh, early. Like you can open a a digital asset we have here, so these uh, orange Houdini things here. We can open them in blueprints, but it still has some uh, more limited functionality. Like you can generate things in blueprints, but you cannot just uh, link blueprint code with uh, uh, these things uh, directly. So that's something that's uh, I think not available right now. And if you're watching and you're wondering, wait, this is an editor tool, what has Blueprints to do with that? And that's the fact that you can actually run um, Blueprints in editor and build Blueprints for editor functionality in Unreal. So I think that's why Julian was asking about that. Um, another question from Julian Boolean, is Houdini able to access the Unreal Engine content browser like a collection of assets in a folder that I want to scatter? I think question, can you point to a folder rather than a specific U asset? Um, hmm. uh, most of the time when you want to scatter something, you will often just directly point to that U asset. Like I want to scatter that model. Uh, we don't have something, I think, to, 
to say like, hey, this is my photo grid model scattered around. I don't think we uh, we have it. But so it's a little bit more similar to the sort of full foliage tool workflow where you specifically yeah, add yeah. Um, what you want the tool to uh, work with. Exactly. It's like that. See here, next question comes from uh, Lunarek, and this is more a little bit of a clarification, but they were wondering, aren't those procedural tools creating thousands of unique assets and tanking the performance with no auto instancing at all? And I think this goes to clarify that it's an editor tool uh, in editor time, right? So it won't process at runtime. Um, and essentially, once you've placed all of these assets in the scene, the uh, the default auto instancing in Unreal Engine will, will do its thing, right? Yeah, yeah. So it's really the idea is that you bake out everything, like with the boot, with the edge damage tool here. This is something that you would bake out as a model, like a static model. Uh, but if you, you can also instance things around, and then it will just use the instancing system from Unreal, and it, it's it's optimized uh, because it's just instancing. Reverse normal was asking: Are there plans for Houdini Engine to be able to output volumes? This would be useful for creating triggers and other level markup inside a Houdini asset. That's possible, though, right? Uh, I mean, uh, I think so, yeah. Yeah, because if you're able to scatter and, and add dynamically add blueprints, you can have a blueprint with a volume and associated yeah. logic to it, right? Yeah, yeah. That so, would, yeah. So for your level generator there, say there was some traps or some doors or any other form of um, blueprints where you know the player entering a volume would trigger some form of logic, um, you can go ahead and, and sort of procedurally add those as another U asset in the uh, level generator, right? Yeah, definitely. Like as soon as you see something that is being instant, you can drag a U, U asset in there. Go make some really dangerous mazes for us to <laughs> to explore. Um, nice guy was asking, does learning Houdini require math above al algebra or is Houdini more based on arithmetic and logical application? Um, depends on like how far or what you do or how far you actually sometimes want to go. Like if I look back on how I learned Houdini, I barely like used any math. I just tried to use basic logic. Like I need to... I have this point, so I want to instance that thing. So it depends a bit on what you want to do. Like even though, like with this boolean edge damage here, like it's 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 a boolean. Like it doesn't use any special like math or algebra. It's it's just boolean damaged pieces with a uh, input. Would you say that it's from sort of just the philosophy of approaching the tool? It's similar to how we have like a large math library inside Unreal Engine, right? You, you don't need to know, um, you know, what a dot product does or what it actually is, right? You just need to know how to use it. Would, would you say that it's similar, sort of working with the tools in Houdini? Yeah, yeah. I mean, all, a lot of things have already been done for you. It's just like you need to know how to use the node, but you don't necessarily need to know, like, the, the whole math behind the node. Like, there is a node for scattering, there's a node for automatically transferring this thing to another thing or calculating distance between objects, like, some things have been built in for Houdini. So most of the time, you don't have to use the math. You just have to know how to use the notes. Even in a job interview for the games industry, very few people will ask you, do you actually know what that function does as long as you know <laughs> how to use it? <laughs> True. Um, let's see here. Another question or a question from Lazybum. Can seeds be auto-randomized on asset instantiation in the editor? So, for example, if you place many trees, they all have different seeds automatically. Um, I would say that that is possible, but that also would increase the calculation time. So if every single instance needs a new seed, then it will, of course, like increase. Like every single instance is a new thing, so it will increase calculation time unless you sort of like already have like a library baked out of trees for example and then you just like randomly pick uh, from the 20 different trees and then it will be a bit more optimized then yeah you almost get like diminishing returns at some point say you have like 10,000 trees right does every single tree need to be like yeah. you know theoretically different um 
a lot of games only have you know a couple of variations and the way that you composite them in the scene um, helps remove any uh, sort of perception of them being the same. Let's see, some other questions about real time. We already covered that. Um, you can always write an Unreal Engine tool, sort of, you know, you can, you can generate all the assets with Houdini, right? And then you can write a, a tool um, for Unreal that can do all of this stuff at runtime. That's why they go so well, so well together. See, going back to some of the earlier questions from your initial starter kit presentation, um, Nova Dice was asking, what are the performance considerations when using Houdini in Unreal Engine? Um, uh, it depends on what you do, because most of the time you just bake it out to, to a mesh, or if you just use instancing, like you're just instancing like you can have a tool that only uses your model that you already have and just places them in the scene for you. So it depends. Like again, like once you hit play, you need to bake everything down. So you don't really have performance that drops from what you need, just like bakes it down when you want to play your game. So it's more of a question of the developer's computer versus the uh, end users when it comes to using Houdini yeah. Engine. Yeah. Get Upgrade that RAM. <laughs> that's, that's, that's usually where you fall short. Yeah, true. Um, some more general questions in regards to um, the usage of Houdini. Um, MR3D Dev was wondering, I think this is a question for both of us, can I use Megascans and Houdini to work in Unreal Engine and still abide by Epic's license of Quixel stuff? Um, so I guess my question for you would be then, are, there, are you aware if there are any limitations on what other forms of assets you are allowed to import and work with in Houdini? Um, I mean, I think if you want to use make scans in Houdini, then, then you, I think you might need a license for it. So I, I think, not a lawyer, but what I know of, uh, about the Megascans license and Megascans being free in Unreal Engine is that if you ship an Unreal Engine product with Megascans, you are you are free to use them, and so that's an important difference because even if you are using Mega Scans in Houdini, you you don't ship Houdini, right? You're not you're not shipping a Houdini application, and so the end product is in fact an Unreal Engine application, and therefore you are good to use Mega Scans. Um, I guess my question was uh, for you and and maybe Ben who is in chat, if in case there are any limitations of using assets of any kind, right? Um, inside Houdini when you're working with it? Uh, My guess would be no. Um, no, I don't think there are any limitations. Uh, I mean, there is ben also Mears, like a bridge for Houdini. So. Uh, ben Mears is saying no limitations that uh, yeah. he's, he's aware of. So go ham. Make <laughs> all the things. See here. Um, next question comes from Alex Kashanya, who's asking: Does Houdini Engine import SOP nodes and associated textures? Um, so yeah, Houdini uses uh, sub based. Oh, yeah, I mean you can just use. Um, I think it was sub or SOP. Um, so I mean, all these tools you see here in my in the scene were all sub based tools. Uh, I did not use any like textures, but I think it's possible that if you have like a material properly set up, it will also import that material. I think I had a material here on my edge damage tool. If I enable here set material for damage, it will actually import a material. So normally they should be red. So this was the red color comes from a material. Uh, inside of Houdini. So if you set the proper material, it normally should uh, import everything correctly. I had no idea what an SOP tool was. <laughs> Node. It's the Houdini magical language. <laughs> I like that. You have sops, stops, vops, <laughs> robs. <laughs> I need to learn the Houdini terminology so I can be as... <laughs> 
as cool as all the Houdini kids. It's just like a, uh, a shortening of like surface operation. Um, here's another good question. I saw this asked a, a couple of times actually, uh, but the question came from Mustafa. Uh, do we need to have Houdini enabled and installed to work with the U4 Houdini plugin? Uh, yeah, I think so. I think you need to install a version of Houdini and also have the plugin. So often the what you often have is that the plugin is bind to uh, the version you have of Houdini. So if you have a Houdini version number 18.5.1, the Houdini plugin is also uh, focused for to work with that Houdini version. That's something important to keep in mind sometimes. Yeah, and that goes to say that who, the Houdini plugin for Unreal is not entirely standalone to the point where since you require Houdini to use it, since we're basically you know, taking the Houdini engine and we're sort of running that inside Unreal and editor time, you're also required to have a license to use Houdini, right? Yeah, yeah. You, the Houdini engine uh, is, is with licensing. So, but, I mean, as soon as you have a license from Houdini, you probably have Houdini engine there for free. There was another question about um, instant static meshes or hierarchical instant static meshes. And um, I think the, the answer is the same, that once you've generated the, um, the asset of the mesh that you were sort of modifying and uh, using Houdini Engine, um, you can then use that asset just like any other static mesh in the editor, right? Yeah. I mean, I baked down here that tree. So if I go back here, like these are normal static geometry. Like there's no special Houdini settings here anymore. It's baked down to normal mesh here. Let's see if we got some last minute questions here. Yes, we did. Um, Alex Kachandra was asking, does the house generator generate the textures? Uh, that I showed in the presentation probably mm -hmm. at the last. Uh, so what we will do is we will instance a, a, a model that's already set up in, in Unreal. So it would just, if you set up the model correctly in Unreal, we just like use that as input for the tool and then it will work fine. Basically the same how I did the, the trees here. So we just set it as an, uh, as an instance here. So in the building generator, we will just plug in a building uh, generator, a uh, building block. Question comes from Corey42. Can you write VEX expressions in UE4? Um, well, I mean, if you make, if you make like a, if you, next, if you expose a certain uh, a string value or value here to write that, that might be possible. So you need to like probably have like a specific uh, parameter to write that. Another question from Alex. Can you generate particle effects um, using the Houdini engine? Uh, we have actually a plugin for Niagara. Oh. Um, so, but it's actually just you do like, like some calculations in Houdini, and then you save that out in a file, which is basically containing the positions of each point. And then that file uh, is then uh, read by Niagara to sort of like replicate that effect. So it can be interesting to uh, look at us. We also have tutorials on that uh, for uh, Niagara plugin. Let's see, um, Create the Imaginable are asking, are Houdini universal scene description meshes supported by Houdini Engine or Unreal? Uh, so you mean USD, right? Mm -hmm. OK. Um, so. I mean, USD can be opened in Unreal or Houdini. So, I mean, you can even make your uh, Houdini tool that is exporting USD. Like, I can here have this uh, built like a export setting for USD in my parameter if I want to.
Is there something you can't do with Houdini? <laughs> <laughs> See, let's grab the last couple of questions here. Yomna uh, uh, Sahab was wondering, so we cannot import the asset in Unreal Engine if we are on Houdini Apprentice? Um, yeah, so Apprentice has some limitation uh, since it is free. Uh, so again, uh, if someone didn't know, like Houdini has a free version which is called Houdini Apprentice, we can uh, use that. It's mainly actually for like learning Houdini and trying out Houdini. Uh, but Houdini Engine uh, or some functionalities of Houdini Apprentice are not uh, available. Like you would probably like you can also use Indie License uh, uh, to make everything that you want. Let's see. Oh, um, another question from a question from Aliens from Space. Can we do Sims in HDA in Unreal Engine? Um, uh, yes and no. Like it depends on what you want. Like um, we can force a tool to calculate at a certain frame. Like if I do water simulation and I convert that to geometry, and I need uh, we can say like at Frame 100, I want to see frame 100 in the viewport. That's possible. But we cannot just like uh, uh, see the fluids uh, instantly by the tool. So we have to either export it to like vertex animation or alembic files, and then we would actually see the result. But uh, Houdini Engine itself um, will only be able to probably like output one frame uh, at a time. So we would have a slider uh, that is sort of like saying what frame needs to be calculated to senior to senior. Maxim Shevtsov was wondering, um, can I generate vector fields with Houdini? Uh, yeah, there are some tools inside of Houdini. I, I don't know if you would have a, need a Houdini engine for that, but inside of uh, Houdini itself, we have some vector field uh, tools. Also like volume slicing and so on. Like if you want to use that for clouds, like you can do volume slicing there as well. Um, question from earlier that I missed. Eugene Flormata is asking, can you create characters with Houdini Engine? Pack meshes with weight and skeletons with uh, kine, kine effects? <laughs> kine effects? Um, not yet, actually. If you watch the talk from Damien, so he's one of the developers, uh, at the end of the talk, he will actually show a glimpse of sort of like what's next for this Houdini Engine because there will be still improvements uh, as long as we go. So that's something that we are definitely like looking at to have a character and then import that with with, uh, with the Reagan soon. Next question comes from Reverse Normal. Does the Houdini engine license permit distribution in mod kits? That one is a little tricky because that would essentially require the user. So say whether it is or isn't, it would require the user who's downloading the mod kit to own a Houdini license. They would actually need to have Houdini installed on their PC. And so I'm not sure that I would ever want to limit a mod kit um, to sort of have a, another tool other than the mod kit being required that isn't like Windows or a text editor or something like that. Uh, but I guess that's a question for Ben, in case you wanted to, in case you, yeah, in case you wanted to ship, um, ship that with a Unreal Engine mod kit, um, if that would be. Yeah, so Ben's saying, you know, you can bake out assets and provide those in a mod kit unattached to Houdini Engine. So, and I think that's the right approach because otherwise you are going to sort of put a, you know, a price tag on being able to use the mod kit, um, mm -hmm. which would limit the reach and uh, the accessibility of, of using your mod kit. Yeah, definitely. Like if you share Houdini files, then you need to open it. Right. Um, Make Believe TV was wondering, do you have, uh, I'm not entirely sure when they asked this, so let's see if you know, uh, do you have mesh crossing problems with this? A ticket? Uh, about the edge damage tool or the road? Or it's not sure. sure. How about you respond about all of them? <laughs> Um, 
yeah, I mean, sometimes it can happen that there is some conflicts in the mesh. Uh, then I would recommend opening session sync so we can see what's going on in real in Houdini, and then we can debug because sometimes we would need to do some mesh cleaning or maybe even remesh some models to get clean results. So, I mean, that sometimes can happen that you maybe need to figure out a way to uh, polish a bit a input model since you don't already know uh, what the input model will be. But most of the time, like with the row tool, uh, it has some little bit clean up uh, uh, with the input, so it uh, can easily figure out intersections and nicely build these things. So yeah, it's you can have issues, but then you probably need to build a procedural system to like clean up some of these issues. Cool. Um, and this is not really a question. It's actually an answer that came from chat. Uh, Don Pepe. 1705 was filling in. For the question about pointing to a folder for instancing from an object pool, you can input the folder path to Houdini uh, and create a CSV from the files in the folder and then just use those names for tagging the scattered points. Thank you, Don Pepe. Appreciate when chat fills in. Um, cool. Those were all the questions that were on topic today, but I did... Uh, I did wanted to message something that came from uh, Zai. Zai, Zai. Um, this is not a question, but thanks a lot, Simon. You make me want to learn more about Houdini every day. Thank you. <laughs> uh, oh, and uh, is there a way we can? Uh, this is a question from Yomna Sahab. Is there a way we can contact Simon without bothering him too much? <laughs> um, <laughs> you can see his Twitter handle, right? Okay, I'm not going to point. You can see his Twitter handle. It's right there. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you can also send me a message on ArchStation. That's also fine. So I'm doing a last check. Cool. Simon, thank you so much for coming on the stream and showing off these tools today. Um, I think we already discussed with Ben Mears that there are some interesting new developments uh, with Houdini that's coming. And we will probably have, um, I don't know if that will be you, Simon, but uh, someone from SideFX will be back to talk about Houdini uh, later this year in August is when we planned. Uh, to do a little bit of a uh, Houdini update. More magical tricks. <laughs> um, with that said, I'm going to do my quick little outro spiel here, and then, then we will be offline. And hopefully I'm going to let Sky know that we're about to wrap this up, and we can try to find someone to raid today. Um, but thanks to everyone who's been watching today. Um, hope you enjoyed the content. Hope it was valuable for you. If you have more questions and would like to continue the conversation, perhaps if you're watching this uh, as a VOD on YouTube or Twitch afterwards and you're not with us here live, uh, it's a great place to continue the conversation is on the forum announcement post uh, that Sky will go ahead and link in just a couple of seconds uh, in both chats. Uh, they're pretty awesome at that. I'm not doing all the po all all the linking anymore. I, I I have help. I've had help. Have had help for quite some time now. It's very nice. Thank you, Sky. Um, head over to the form announcement post. That's the place for post discussions. YouTube comments, not the best when it comes to technical uh, conversations, uh, but the new forums. Um, are good at that. Um, if you're looking to find other people in the community that might potentially live close to your area, uh, go ahead and visit communities.unrealengine.com. It has a locator tool where you can find meetup groups in your area. And now you might wonder, but we're not really seeing each other right now during the pandemic. And that is true, but these groups are still active and they're hosting meetups on their various Discord channels. Um, if you don't have a meetup group near you and you and a couple of friends would like to start one, uh, there's a little become a there's a form, top right of the page. <laughs> Brain freeze, forgot what it, what it says today. Uh, there's a form you can go ahead and contact us if you would like to become a meetup group lead, um, and then you get access to our, our tool bevy, which helps you organize these meetups, uh, give you a little bit of, of publicity. Um, also, make sure that you visit our, our, our forums, Discord. Uh, we have an unofficial Discord channel called Unreal Slackers. Uh, it is fantastic. Some of them are here in chat. Everyone give it up for Pfist. I've seen him. Um, he's around, uh, one of the awesome admins and moderators who make that community as awesome as it is. Um, you can also find us on Facebook, Reddit, Twitter, LinkedIn, all the places. Um, and we generally post on most of them. So if you have one platform that you are more interested in or more comfortable with, um, you can just go ahead and follow us there. 
Um, we do a community spotlight every week, and we also add those spotlights to the Epic Games launcher. Um, and to make your projects uh, visible for us, you can go ahead and post them in the forum release channel. There's a work in progress channel. Uh, tagging at Unreal Engine on Twitter is another good way. We frequently check all of those. Um, and anything that comes our way, we sort of it's always considered for the community spotlight. You can also just go ahead and email community at unrealengine.com if you sort of have planned an announcement and you would like to get in touch and let us know that it's that it's coming. Um, we keep a close eye on that email as well. Um, the countdown videos that we play at the stream every week, um, they are 30 minutes of development, or so usually 30 minutes of development. I realized that the last new one that we received from the main Stark um, was actually not what I say every week, and I thought it was great. So Five minutes of footage is what we're asking for. Uh, send that to us together with your logo, and we will go ahead and composite that into the countdown that we play every week. Have some new ones coming up soon. If you stream on Twitch, make sure you use the Unreal Engine tag as well as the game development ones. They are the two that makes it easy for us to filter all the content that's on Twitch so that we can find you when you're live. Um, and that's precisely the way that we search for people when we go ahead to rate them afterwards. For those of you out on YouTube right, uh, right now, there's no rate feature, but if you want to continue to watch more Unreal Engine content, you can hop over to twitch.tv slash Unreal Engine. Um, and yes, I said, follow us on social media. That's where all news Unreal comes. Uh, and uh, side effects Twitter handle. I think it's just at side effects, isn't it? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, at side effects. It uh, should be posted on the form announcement post as well where all things information lives in regards to the streams. Make sure you hit that notification bell on YouTube if you want to see when we go live there. And uh, next week, I have a stream, but I can't announce it. Oh, no, wait, I can. Yes, because yesterday was when the Meta Human Early Access um, sign-up went live. So I can't say that. I just was not able to put it in the newsletter for this month. We will go ahead and cover have some of the developers from the Meta Human Creator tool on the stream next week, and we will go through MetaHuman Creator, watch a little bit uh, and see what goes on behind the scenes, what the plans are for the future, et cetera. Quite excited by that. I think we have four uh, developers from the team on the stream next week. Cool, and that's my outro spiel. I've done my talking for today. Simon, thank you so much for coming on the stream once again. Uh, chat, please give it up for Simon and Ben Mears who made sure that this stream happened today. Um, go ahead and visit, I really should know the SideFX website. Simon, why don't you plug the SideFX website where you can get Houdini? I mean, <laughs> just side effects. That's it. <laughs> just you know, Google just, like, Yeah, you know, but it's so it's so it's so boring. Just I just go Google it. You know, just go Google it. Like, <laughs> yeah, we all know it's on Google, but you know, sometimes you just want to know. You want to punch in that web address. You know where you're going. You don't get any ads. You don't get any of the other stuff. It's just that's where I want to go. Um, awesome. Uh, anything else, Simon? You would like to leave chat with today before we go offline? I mean, it was great to be here and. Thanks everyone for uh, for watching us, and I hope I got some people excited to try it with me. I think you did. They said so, so <laughs> I'll take that as as proof. Awesome. I hope you're all staying safe out there. We will see you all again next week at the same time. Take care, everyone. Mm -hmm.